Hi, my name is John Dixon. In this presentation, I'm going to go through the essential quality control of gamma cameras. And what I mean by essential is the quality control that you really should be doing uh, as, as part of your routine quality control program. So if I first look at the outline of the presentation, I'll first um, discuss the concept of quality assurance and quality control. I'll then go on to discuss some general quality console control considerations. So there's certain things we must think about when we're setting up um, our acquisitions and our processing of our quality control tests. We know that quality control is important for us to ensure our Im images are of good quality. So, you know, quality control is to make sure that these images are of good quality. So we really then need to define what makes a bad image or a poor image. So once we've defined what a bad image might uh, look like, we can then look at tests to try and look at the quality of our imaging system to avoid this poor quality. And finally, I'll point to some useful guidance and resources that are available uh, to you to help you with your quality control programs. So let's first talk about um, the concept of quality assurance and quality control. But before we can do this, it is important to make some definitions. So quality assurance is a set of activities for ensuring the proper outcome of a complete process. So in our field, we can consider this to be a nuclear medicine investigation, the whole investigation from maybe even beyond that, from referral to report. Whereas quality control is about testing products and equipment or processes to identify any defects or any issues with those processes or those equipment those equipment. So if we focus on the quality assurance of a gamma camera, which is a part of the more widespread quality control that we have in nuclear medicine, which might include things like, um, you know, our reporting, our, our referrals, etc., how we handle the whole process, we can break that down just to look at the quality assurance of a gamma camera. And that consists of the following um, elements. We have the acceptance testing. Now, what we're trying to do here with acceptance testing is to ensure that the equipment is working appropriately and within the manufacturer's specification immediately after we've installed the gamma camera. We then have a commissioning step. Now, commissioning is about setting performance standards, our baselines for our quality control. So once we've got our new camera installed and we know that it meets specification, we know it's working at peak performance. So at this point, we'll set our baseline uh, you know, values uh, for quality control. And equally important, at the commissioning stage, we should also make sure our equipment is ready for clinical use. So this will be doing things like setting up our imaging protocols and optimizing our imaging protocols, make sure they're fitting with guidelines as well, very important. And then the final part of our gamma camera quality assurance is the quality control itself. So this is going to be our periodic testing of the gamma camera to try and find performance deficits and the things that we do to ensure that we've got ongoing consistent performance of our gamma camera. So in this presentation, I'm going to be um, focusing mostly on quality control, but I think it is still worth uh, touching on acceptance testing and commissioning. So I'll do that briefly now. So for acceptance testing, our, all gamma cameras uh, have specification sheets. So if you go to Siemens or GE or Mediso or Philips, they'll give you a list of specifications for things like spatial resolution or energy resolution. And these are generally defined um, by this body called NEMA. 
which is a North American uh, body, but it's used internationally. In particular for a gamma camera, they have these specifications listed in this document here, NEMA NU1-2018. So what's the point of these specifications? Well, there's a couple of um, you know, things that they're there for. Really primarily they're there to allow the comparison of imaging systems. So if you were trying to buy a gamma camera and you didn't know if you wanted you know, a G or Philips or Siemens or Mediso, you might want to look at how each of those bits of equipment compare to each other. So by following the NEMA guidelines, we can then make comparison because we know that the measurements have been made to these standards. That's very helpful. Now, these tests tend to be performed in a lab environment. So they tend to be performed in the, um, you know, the equipment manufacturer's labs. But we can copy these tests pretty much completely in a nuclear medicine clinic. So what we're trying to do here is if when we get our gamma camera and we have it installed, if we try and repeat these NEMA tests, what we can do is ensure that the system that we just purchased is, is performing at the very highest level. And it's a level which is consistent with the manufacturer's specifications. So we know that the equipment is performing as best as it possibly can at acceptance testing. And that is the aim of acceptance testing. Commissioning, as I said before, really is two steps to it. The main one really is working with our doctors to optimize our imaging protocols, make sure all our scanning protocols are uh, exactly what our doctors need to produce their clinical report. And so the second element is to set up these baseline values because immediately after acceptance testing, the performance of our gamma camera is going to be at its highest level. So this is a perfect time to look at, you know, do repeat um, tests of periodic QC and get a range of what we know our gamma camera is capable of. So that when we go on to our routine periodic quality control, we can see if our daily values or monthly values are falling outside these periodic, um, th these baseline values. So really the commissioning and doing these baseline QC tests is telling us what good performance looks like for our routine uh, quality control that we'll be doing throughout the lifetime of the, the system. Okay, before I go into detail, we have to think of, uh, take on some general considerations um, of how we set up our acquisitions and our processing for our quality control. And I'm just going to briefly go through some of these now. Pardon. First of all, uh, we've got to think about intrinsic and system measurements. So intrinsic measurements are without the collimator. And these offer advantages in that um, the detector is not now blurred by any collimator effects. So if we have non-uniformities, for example, we're more likely to see them with intrinsic measurements without the collimator than when we put the collimator on and the blur of the collimator might um, you know, take away these or, or make these um, non-uniformities harder to see. Intrinsic measurements also allow us to use smaller activity sources because of course we don't have a collimator in place, which is mostly lead. But the disadvantage of intrinsic measurements, of course, is that if there's any issues with the collimator itself, if it's damaged or just looking at the collimator performance generally, we're not including the assessment of the full imaging system. So system measurements, or some people might think of these as extrinsic uh, quality control measurements are with the collimator. And the advantages of this is that we're looking at the complete imaging system. It mimics the imaging we're doing in our nuclear medicine clinics. So that is perfect. You know, we really want to look at the performance uh, that we're going to be getting when we're imaging our patients. We've got to remember that actually um, the, some of our measurements will be collimator specific. So for example, the spatial resolution, we know that the uh, system spatial resolution will be dependent on the collimator that we have on the system. Um, 
we need higher activity sources uh, because of um, the uh, reduced sensitivity because we have the collimator in place. And we've got to make a decision on whether scatter is included in our measurements or not. Often scatter is included, but we'll come on to all these things in more detail as we go through this presentation. Some other factors to be considered are the radionuclide that we're using, the energy window we're using, whether scatter is included or not. As we've said, the collimator is going to have an effect and the collimator that we choose, if it is a system measurement, uh, the collimator that we're using will make a, a, a difference to our measurements as well. In the gamma camera, we can consider two fields of view. We have the usable field of view, which is pretty much the complete gamma camera detector. I think you lose a, a two or 3% around the edge of the detector because right at the very edge, the performance can be suboptimal just because it's right at the edge. And then we have the central field of view, which is the central 75% of the usable field of view. So we know that for central measurements, we would expect better performance just because there's more um, photomultiplier tubes involved in the detection process and we're not getting edge effects from reflection off the edge of the scintillation crystal. Uh, two other things we must consider is the count rate or the count or the count density that we've got in our QC measurements and the pixel and matrix size. So I'm just going to go into some of these in a little more detail. So the radionuclide, we know that most of our imaging is performed with technetium 99M and therefore we generally try to do most of our tests with technetium 99M. Although sometimes, as you'll be aware, we might choose to use cobalt 57 because it's more convenient and its emission properties are similar to technetium 99M. But, you know, we know that other radionuclides will have different performance. So if we were imaging with iodine 123 or iodine 131, some of our measurements will uh, change depending on the radionuclide that we use. The energy windows, I put this up here, but really it's, it's not that much of an issue because I think for many people, uh, we use the manufacturer recommended uh, energy windows and we just stick with those throughout the lifespan of the scanner. But it's still important to be aware that actually, if you are wanting to change the energy windows used, it will affect the performance of your quality control measurements or the outputs or the outcomes of your quality control measurements. Scatter, do we include it? Do we exclude it? We know that if we have scatter in our images, it will degrade the performance. And pixel size or matrix size, we know when we choose our pixel size, uh, we're making a compromise between the noise in, in our image and our spatial sampling. So if I think about pixel size choices, you know we have uh, the noise characteristics of our gamma camera. We know gamma cameras follow Poisson statistics, which means the uncertainty in a pixel value is defined as the standard, if we define it as the standard deviation, the standard deviation with Poisson statistics is the square root of the pixel value. So let's think if we had a 64 matrix with one pixel that had 100 counts, the uncertainty would be square root of 100, which is 10, 10 counts which means that our uh, uncertainty would be 10%. Now, if we acquired the same amount of counts completely, you know, for the whole detector, if we move to a one to eight matrix, the count density is going to be reduced because we're changing the sampling. So at this point, we're now moving to 25 counts per pixel. And you can see here that the uncertainty then moves to 25%. So if we're using a larger pixel, we'll get less uncertainty or less variability in the signal uh, on a pixel value and our data will be less noisy. So we should consider you know, for certain tests, we might choose to go with a less noisy image because of the advantages it offers. The compromise of course is sampling so that you know, maybe we, we need to use a smaller pixel size for things like spatial resolution. Because we'll remember that 
sampling theory dictates to us that the pixel size should be at most half the object size. So if we were trying to resolve a four millimeter object, the pixel size should be two millimeters. And uh, for a standard gamma camera field of view, a 256 matrix would give us a pixel size of 1.56 millimeters. So if we were looking at these four millimeter objects or measuring spatial resolution intrinsically, which is around four millimeters, uh, our pixel size, uh, sorry, our matrix size should be you know, 256 or, or, or even better actually. So it's important to choose the correct pixel size for the test. And different tests will either push you towards reducing noise or push you towards um, improving spatial sampling. Okay, so now we've talked about the background, let's get on to the actual gamma camera quality control. So as I said in the outline, you know, what we're trying to do with quality control is ensure a good imaging performance. So to do that, it's really important, I think, to consider what a badly performing system would look like. What is bad? so that we can test it to make sure that we're not bad, we're performing well, our images are good. Well, I think we can narrow it down to three points. The first one is a, a bad system would have a non-uniform response across the detector. So if we're acquiring an image of a patient, the changes in signal should represent physiological changes and not any spatial variation in the detector response. So therefore, it's important that we look at the uniformity of response of our detector. The second point I think we need to look at is the detector sensitivity. As we've just seen on the previous slide, if we have less counts in our voxels, our pixels, we get noisier studies. So we need to make sure that we have appropriate and consistent sensitivity to ensure our scans can be done in a timely manner. And that you know, if we uh, keep doing these tests, the sensitivity being consistent, we know that if we acquire an image for 10 minutes, the acquired counts will be the same after you know, acquisition, after acquisition, after acquisition. And the third point I want to highlight is um, poor detection and or reduced contrast of features. So you know, in imaging, we're looking at features within our image be it hot features or cool features. So if we have bad scatter rejection, what will happen is we'll get blurring around the boundaries of our features and we'll reduce contrast. So we should look at the scatter rejection. And if we had poor spatial resolution, we limit what we can see in our images. So we should also be testing the spatial resolution of our system. One thing that kind of we also should think about as well, so we can think of this as a fourth uh, consideration, is the count linearity. There needs to be a linear relationship between the physiolog physiological signal and what we measure. So what I'm saying is whatever uh, count density is coming out of our patient should be reflected with the count density that is being uh, detected by our system. So this is uh, the linearity of our system and we should look at this as well. Okay, so let's look at some of the tests. So we'll start with the test of uniformity. So as we know, uh, uniformity is often done with or without a collimator. Without, um, a collimator, as we said earlier on, it's more sensitive to detect the performance, but with a collimator, it's more relevant to clinical use. What can go wrong? What can give us bad uniformity? Again, I think it's important to consider what might be the underlying issues here with our um, tests. Well, we can get difference in the photomultiplier tube gains or a misbalancing of the outputs of our photomultiplier tubes across the field of view. We might have some positioning non-linearities. We might have some issues with our crystals. So for example, if we have hydration in our crystal, 
that is going to affect the light transferring into the photomultiplier tubes, which will affect the uh, uniformity of our measurements. Um, optical coupling again, so we know that we usually have some kind of um, uh, gel uh, between our photomultiplier tubes and the scintillation crystal, and sometimes that can dry out or that that uh, interface can, can fail. So optical coupling can be a problem for us. And for system measurements, damaged collimators can give us uh, an issue too. But of course, uh, yeah, these are for system measurements. So how often should we be doing uniformity uh, measurements? Every time you're scanning, any day that you're scanning a patient, you really should be looking at the uniformity for technetium or cobalt 57, if that's your preferred way of of doing routine quality control. Um, for other radionuclides like iodine 131 or iodine 123, of course, it depends on your system a little bit and depends on how stable your system is. But I think generally, half yearly for uh, radionuclides other than technetium 99 is probably appropriate. Okay, so how do we measure intrinsic uniformity? So if we look at the left of the image here, we start off with our technetium 99M source, although we could use cobalt 57. It's not commonly used to put this source in some kind of lead shield or with copper plates, but if you do that, you get um, a cleaner energy spectrum, which you, you might like, you might not. It's not essential, but I put that in there because you can do it. And this source needs to be five usable fields of view, more than five usable fields of view away from the detector. So we know that with a point source, it's going to follow the inverse square law. So we can see by the dashed lines that I've drawn on this diagram that um, you know, the, the, the central distance is shorter than the, you know, the, the, the upper and lower dashed lines. But if we move our source far enough away, the difference between the length of those lines or the difference between the radiation flux, more importantly, is, you know, around 1%, which is adequate for what we need to do. So when you're doing intrinsic measurements, yes, use a point source, move it a distance away, uh, five usable, at least five usable fields of view. Now, some of you may have systems where point sources can be placed closer, but what generally happens on these systems is if you look at the raw data that's acquired, you will see an inverse square law effect. But the software that the manufacturers use will correct for this inverse square law to try and you know, account for, for it and, and give you some kind of uniform image. So uh, without any processing, you need this distance source. So we've done the measurement. What do we do next? Uh, well. Suppose we should consider the pixel size. We're wanting uh, low noise here because what we're trying to do is we're trying to um, we're trying to look at the underlying performance of the detector. So we don't want a noisy image, and therefore we generally use quite a big pixel size, and we try and get lots of counts per pixel. And in fact, if you look at NEMA, they'll also suggest you smooth the data as well. And then we look at the uniformity in the uh, central field of view and the usable field of view, as I defined earlier. And there's two forms of uniformity that we'll measure. There is integral uniformity, which is looking at global non-uniformities, and differential uniformity, which is looking at regional non-uniformities. So uh, how do we calculate each of these? Well, actually, the equations are actually uh, the same. So for integral uniformity, we have the maximum pixel value minus the minimum pixel value divided by the max plus min pixel values times by 100. Uh, same for differential, but where the differences lie here is that with integral uniformity, the maximum and minimum pixel values are anywhere within the field of view. And that's why it's looking at the global non-uniformity. With differential uh, uniformity, we're actually only looking at the maximum, minimum, five pixel ranges. So we're looking at local non-uniformities. So we do this by scanning through the image and looking at the biggest difference 
between pixel values in a five pixel range uh, in X and Y. Once we find that uh, location, we can then calculate the differential uniformity. Just to show you some results. So um, this is a, a good uniformity, low, low values for our measurement is good. So you can see here it says 3.39%. And <clears throat> you can see you know, there is some noise in the image, but you can see that actually the response seems to be pretty uniform. And in this particular piece of software, it highlights where the maximum and minimum pixel value is for this integral uniformity measurement made in this instance. Here's an example of poor uniformity. And this one was actually found to be caused by uh, decoupling of the photomultiplier tubes and the crystal. So you can see, uh, you know, there's still noise there, but you can see a kind of blotchy or blobby appearance to the image. So if you see something like this, you know you've got uh, an issue. I think something important to say about uniformity, um, you know, we, we look at the calculated values of uniformity, but we should also visually inspect as well, because sometimes these uh, uh, quantities, these values we calculate aren't sensitive to uh, non-uniformities as much as, as, as our eye. So please calculate the uniformity, do trend analysis, that's wonderful, but also look at the image. It's really important to look at the image as well. So system uniformity with the collimator on, testing the whole system. If we use the same setup as we used for intrinsic uniformity, our point source would be seen as a blurred point with, you know, with the collimators on, we'd still see a blurred point with, from this distant point source. So what we really need if we're doing a system uniformity measurement is a distributed activity source. So we can purchase uh, rectangular phantoms that we can fill with technetium and water. Um, but you know, these, these tanks, are, uh, uh, phantoms are, are really quite big. They're difficult to mix, they're heavy, they're not very practical to use. So what many people do instead is they'll use a cobalt 57 source where that cobalt 57 is absorbed into resin. So you can see on the right there, that here's just an example of a, a cobalt 57 source for system uniformity. So we have that uniform flux, the radiation is embedded in the resin and it's distributed uniformity, uh, uniformly. So why, um, why cobalt-57? Well, the photo peak energy of cobalt-57 is 122 keV, which of course is very close to the 140 keV of technetium 99M. So to use cobalt-57, uh, it's a good uh, thing to use as a substitute for uh, technetium if you're looking at system uniformity. And again, when you're looking, if you're measuring system uniformity, all the same things apply. You're looking at high uh, count images, you're looking at relatively large pixel sizes, and you'll calculate the integral and differential uniformity for the usable, uh, usable field of view and the central field of view. So as I said, I think this is an essential test of your performance. You know, so many things, you can find out so many things from a, a uniformity test before you put um, the patient onto the scanner. If there's uniformity issues, you'll see it. If there's energy resolution issues, you'll often see it. Most issues that can occur with a gamma camera, you'll pick up with a uniformity test. So at the very least, I think it's really important to do a system uniformity measurement before you scan your patients on, on, on any given day. So our second point was sensitivity. So this is going to be dependent on the energy of the radionuclide photons. So for example, we know that iodine-131 photons are much more energetic than those from technetium, um, which means that the crystal is less able to stop those photons and give us a measurable signal uh, with iodine-131 compared to technetium-99M. 
Uh, the thickness of the crystal helps. Again, if we have a thicker crystal, we're more likely to stop and get a signal. We'll stop these photons and get a signal from our system. So thicker, thicker crystal systems are available for iodine-131 imaging, um, if you have one of those. And the energy window used, of course, will have an effect. Um, because if we have a narrow energy window, we might be better at rejecting scatter, uh, but we'll lose sensitivity. What can go wrong? Uh, again, it's our badly tuned photomultiplier tubes can give us an issue, crystal issues, or damaged collimator. How often should we do this test? It doesn't need to be done that often. Sensitivity on modern systems is relatively stable. So unless you have a, a system that is giving you issues, six monthly is probably adequate. But if you're performing quantitative imaging, you might want to perform this test more frequently. So for example, if you're doing technetium imaging of the thyroid, where you're looking at the percentage of the technetium that goes into the thyroid, um, then you'll need some kind of sensitivity measurement. So you, you may choose to do that sensitivity measurement more frequently in that case. The measurement's relatively simple to do. Um, if you look at the top right there, we have some kind of a thin cylindrical phantom, relatively small. And we fill that with a known amount of activity. Um, so we'll measure the syringe before and after we fill that small phantom. So we know exactly how much activity is in there. We place that phantom 10 centimeters away from the detector. This is a system measurement, of course, so the collimator is in place. We have to place the uh, source 10 centimeters away to avoid uh, collimator scepter effects. If you place this phantom on the, um, actually on the collimator, you might get different values just by where you position the, the phantom on that collimator. And the measurement's relatively simple. Uh, you acquire for, let's say, two minutes. You look at how many counts per second you've acquired in that two minutes, and you know what the activity of the source is. So you can then look at the or calculate the sensitivity in terms of counts per second per megabecquerel. Some people may also do some background measurements or draw a region outside the, um, outside the phantom, and that's acceptable as well. I'm not going to go into the details there, but there's plenty of guidance in, in documents to tell you how to do that. Okay, so the third point we mentioned was feature detection, and this had two elements, the energy resolution. And how do we measure this? Well, the energy spectra is actually routinely given in patient examination. So whenever you're scanning a patient um, or a phantom, just flick onto the energy spectrum screen and just make sure that the, uh, you know, the energy spectra is looking you know, the right kind of width and that your window is in the right place. If you're doing uniformity quality control, often if you're using the manufacturer's software, it will at the same time give you an energy resolution measurement. If that's not the case, the manufacturers will give you a very simple and easy way to calculate the, um, the energy resolution. It can be measured with or without a collimator and it's quantified in terms of the full width half maximum and full width 10th maximum of a Gaussian fit through the energy response. What can go wrong? Photomultiplier tubes again, crystal inhomogeneities again, poor coupling again between the crystal and the photomultiplier tubes. Periodicity, as I said, you really should try and do this as part of your uniformity quality control and your technologists, you should encourage them that when you're, they're imaging patients, they should just have a quick look at the energy spectra to make sure it is uh, peaked appropriately and seems to be of an appropriate width. The second element of feature detection was the measurement of spatial resolution. So again, we know that this can be done with or without a collimator. And actually, we'll, we also are aware that the system resolution with the collimator on is a composite of the intrinsic spatial resolution and the geometric collimator resolution. 
uh, which is defined by the whole width, the whole width and the whole length of the collimator. And therefore, because these things are all linked together, we really should be looking at both the intrinsic and the system spatial resolution. Because if there's any issues, we need to know which side the issue is with. Is it with the collimator or is it actually with the detector? So we need to measure both. What can go wrong? I've listed them there. Um, the badly tuned matched photomultiplier tubes, positioning, uh, nonlinearities, uh, maybe a damaged scepter if you're doing a system measurement. Um, periodicity uh, for system spatial resolution, probably six monthly. For intrinsic spatial resolution, it's quite challenging, as I'll show you in a moment. So um, not that often, I think, is the answer there. Maybe, um, yeah, we'll come on to this in a moment. So for intrinsic measurements, um, we use the same setup as we had before. We have a distant, a distant technetium or cobalt source, which prov provides a usable, sorry, provides a uniform flux of uh, radiation hitting our detector. But this time what we do is we'll place a mask directly onto the crystal. This will be an X max mask, and then we'll repeat the measurement with a Y mask. And this is why we tend not to do this measurement too often, because uh, obviously the crystal, the scintillation crystal is very fragile. And those masks are made of lead. So it's very easy to damage your crystal by doing this measurement. So really, you should be doing this with your manufacturer engineers that um, look after the system. And maybe, um, you know, do it do it occasionally, maybe do it annually, biannually, whenever you feel as though there might be an issue um, or whenever there's an opportunity to do it, I think, um, for intrinsic spatial resolution. So what do we do? We paste these masks on the sister, uh, on the crystal. Uh, we get a very high count profile. We'll be looking at a smaller pixel size here to get the good spatial sampling. And uh, we'll look at the full width half maximum and the full width 10th maximum spatial resolution. Um, and you know, just showing in the graph in the bottom right here, how we define that, we look at the maximum of our profile, the full width half maximum is the width of that profile at half the maximum height. And uh, the full width 10th maximum is the width of the profile at the 10th of maximum height. This phantom uh, is often also used to assess spatial linearity. Um, so if you put these masks onto your system, it's worthwhile also doing a spatial linearity measurement. Now, what happens with spatial linearity is you'll acquire the data. You put uh, lines of best fit through um, your image data, and then you look at the deviation of um, you know, the pixel values from that line of best fit. And you do that in the X and Y direction. So it's, it, it, it's a useful test to do spatial linearity if you have a linearity issue. Um, but actually in routine quality control, it's not really that necessary. Um, so I won't be worried if you don't do that test very often, but if you have the masks on uh, your gamma camera, it's worthwhile looking at the spatial linearity while uh, we're doing the, the spatial intrinsic spatial resolution test. The system spatial resolution um, is performed differently, of course, because now we have the collimator on. We have two very small one millimeter diameter or thereabouts um, point sources or line sources, which we need to have 10 centimeters away from the camera, again, to avoid any scepter effects. If we put it directly on the, on the collimator, the measurement will depend on whether these sources uh, fall over a hole or fall onto a scepter. Um, what, what is frequently done is actually if you get four line sources, which uh, you know, people typically use capillary tubes, you fill these uh, four line sources and you use them to make a 10 centimeter square on a piece of paper, just stick your line sources onto a piece of paper. Uh, uh, to form this 10 centimeter square, because then what you can do is your spatial resolution might come out in terms of pixel. But if you know that your line sources are separated by 10 centimeters, 
you can use that information to convert your spatial resolution in terms of pixel to uh, spatial resolution in terms of distance. So once more, we're going to acquire a high count um, small pixel size profile and determine the spatial resolution for full width half maximum and full width tenth maximum. An alternative test for system spatial resolution is to use this thing you'll see on the top left of the slide here, which is a bar phantom, a quadrant bar phantom. Now this bar phantom has strips of lead in a resin that is um, transparent to our radiation photons. So what we can do, and it's a relatively easy test to do, is we can put that phantom on top of our collimator and put a cobalt 57 source on top of the phantom to transmit radiation through the phantom onto our detector to produce an image like you see in the bottom left. So using this, we can make a qualitative assessment of spatial resolution by counting the number of quadrants that are visible uh, where we can see the bars. And you can also look at the linearity here as well. So hopefully each of those bars is looking like a line. And if it isn't, then maybe you have a linearity issue. So the use of this phantom is a lot simpler. Um, you can actually make quantitative measurements. And if you look at the IAEA Nuclear Medicine QC Toolkit, They'll, um, they have a bit of software that which will help you um, get spatial resolution measurements from a bar phantom acquisition. You can also place this bar phantom onto the crystal if you want to do an intrinsic measurement, but again, um, very dangerous, be wary, um, and it's probably not necessary. So um, if you want to, that's fine, but um, to do it with the collimator on is probably adequate. So the final test I want to bring up is the test of count linearity, which is also known as count rate performance. So what is count rate performance? Why are we interested? Well, we know with our gamma camera that the processing of an event, so this is a radiation photon getting through the collimator and hitting the crystal, that Processing of the uh, light hit from the scintillation crystal takes a finite amount of time because we're going to have light decay in the crystal. We're going to have some electronic processing. So we have a dead time, uh, which is the time it takes for this um, scintillation to be detected and uh, processed. Now, if two gamma photons enter the detector in an interval less than the dead time, then one or both of those gamma rays or gamma photons might be lost. So that means that when we get very high gamma ray event rates, count rates, um, we will lose sensitivity and we'll lose linearity. There is a maximum limit on our count rate. So there's two types of dead time. Um, there's a paralyzable uh, system which means that when the gamma photon enters the detector within the dead time of the previous event, the dead time is extended. So you know, the system has been paralyzed and the dead time uh, is extended. A non-paralyzable system, what happens here is when the gamma photon enters the detector within the dead time from the previous event, the gamma ray, that gamma, ray, uh, gamma photon is ignored and the dead time is not extended. So the gamma camera is a paralyzable system, which means that what happens is that it becomes nonlinear at high count rates. So we need to find out where we're getting this nonlinearity to ensure that we're not affecting the clinical images that we're acquiring. So how do we do this? There's a number of ways of doing it, but uh, I generally use a very high activity uh, source, which of course is decaying away. And if we acquire a dynamic series of data, or if we uh, you know, acquire data over time, so maybe um, acquire, take an, a, an image of the source uh, at time zero, then one hour and two hours and three hours, you don't need to leave the source acquiring all the time, although sometimes it's just easier to do it overnight and acquire it as a dynamic series. So then we're gonna look at the linear response region. So what you'll get, if you look at the uh, plot of activity of our source by the observed count rate, 
we'll get this, um, you know, I'm showing the line that we want to get, but what we actually get is it falls off this line, the actual response. So if we look at the linear response region at the low activities, we extrapolate that up and we look at the, um, the points, the activity at which we get 10% count loss and 20% count loss. And that's how we do count rate performance tests. Fortunately, pretty much all gamma camera imaging is performed in the linear zone. So this test is something that you might do occasionally, but really it's, it's not one you need to do a lot. Oh, sorry. So um, that finishes the um, formal part of the teaching, but I did promise you some guidance. So the IAEA have some uh, very helpful um, uh, pieces of guidance that are accessible to you, uh, freely accessible if you want them electronically, although if you want paper copies, you can purchase paper copies. So the top document is the uh, quality control atlas for uh, scintillation camera systems. So this is really good at giving you lots of different examples of different artifacts and things that might occur on your gamma camera. And you can look through there and either learn or if you have an issue with your system, you can look for the artifact that you're seeing within this book and, 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 and work out what the issue is. There's the Quality Assurance for SPECT Systems book. Now, I know mostly at the moment we've concentrated on planar measurements. Um, the, this Quality Assurance for SPECT Systems also covers what we've just talked about. So that's a helpful uh, guidance document for you. Similarly, there's some tutorial videos on quality control tests for SPECT Systems. Um, so if you want to watch a video of people doing quality control and, and, and um, analyzing it, then those videos are very good. And there's also spec CT atlas of quality control and image artifacts, which also mentions some of the planar uh, measurements that we've talked about today. And again, shows some artifacts that you might find. So uh, there's some uh, four helpful, uh, useful documents for you. So in summary, uh, we've gone through the concept of quality assurance and quality control. We've defined them and we've hopefully explained to you why they're important. We've looked at general um, quality console considerations. So when you're doing the tests, what pixel size do you use? We have to be aware of the energy window. We have to be aware of the radionuclide, whether we're using a collimator, et cetera. We looked at what makes a poor image before looking at how we can test to make sure our images aren't of poor quality. And then finally, um, we went through some of the guidance and resources that are available to you. Thank you very much for your attention. That concludes this presentation. Thank you.